Hello, this is Matt Burns one final time talking about tier three interventions for math. There are lots of really good interventions. My colleagues and I did a, a review of the literature and identified practices with large effects, smaller negative effects for both elementary and adolescents. We know what works for reading, math, and writing. But what we don't do enough of is picking the right intervention to match the kids' needs. In tier three, we oftentimes talk about doing a more in-depth analysis to figure out what a student's needs are. But unfortunately, many of those analyses involve looking at various cognitive processes to try and pinpoint the weakness for the individual kid. Well, a review of meta-analyses, and this is something I published in 2017, where I looked at seven meta-analyses and concluded that these are all meta-analyses that look at using cognitive processes, measures, and interventions like working memory, et cetera, to try and improve academic outcomes. And you can see pretty clearly, again, these are effect sizes. So a larger the effect, the better the intervention, but 0.2 is a small effect, 0.5 is moderate, and 0.8 is large. And when you look at these effects, we can draw a couple of things clearly. First of all, working memory training and assessments and so on, working memory does nothing for reading and math. The effect sizes are 0 0.07 for mathematics to 0 0.13 for decoding. Um, and when you look at the, the second meta-analysis, again, the meta-analysis for working memory training for mathematics, 0 0.09 for decoding, 0 0.15. Working memory doesn't seem to transfer well, working memory training to working memory let alone reading math. And after decades of research and 203 studies that I found, the average effect size is 0.27. It just doesn't work. Looking at cognitive processes and use those data to drive academic interventions just doesn't work. But the good news is we do know it does work and we have to look at data, collect data to drive intervention. So what I do is I recommend we use this framework, which is the learning hierarchy. So it starts, it runs through four phases. As kids learn, they, they follow these, as anybody learns, adults, kids, whatever, we follow these four phases. We start off in acquisition. That's kids who are slow and inaccurate. They need modeling, explicit instruction, immediate corrective feedback. Then we move into proficiency, where kids are now accurate but slow. That's a kid that can do it, but he has to really, really, really think about it. So he's accurate, but like he counts on his fingers, et cetera, but it takes a long time to do it. Once they're accurate and can do it at sufficient speed, that's when they move into generalization. And then they can apply it to a novel setting. And then finally, once they can generalize it, they use the information to solve problems. Using information to solve problems is what we're all about. But if the kid's functioning in the acquisition phase, they're slow and inaccurate, or in the proficiency phase, they're accurate but slow, they can't use the information to solve problems. They first have to obtain sufficient accuracy and then sufficient speed. Speed does matter. A child has to be able to do it with sufficient speed to generalize it. Unless it's automatic to the point of automaticity, they can't generalize it. So they have to be accurate, then fast, and then they can generalize it and use it to solve problems. So when this kid is not doing well, we think of this process. The kid's either struggling to learn it in the first place, struggling to remember it, or struggling to generalize it and therefore be able to apply it. So there are interventions for each of these. For time's sake, I can't really discuss what this means, what these interventions are, but I'll hit just a few of them briefly. Starting with acquire. So acquire means that the child is struggling to learn it in the first place. That's the kid that you teach it to them, and as soon as you're done with it, you ask them what you just taught them, and they don't know. And what we do with that is two things. Again, for time's sake, I can't explain this in a lot of detail, but there's certainly information online. So acquisition rate. The main, and one problem with uh, teaching kids a set of information is we try and teach too much. When we try and teach too much, they forget what they've learned. So it, it's what PJ called it retroactive cog cognitive interference. If a child is capable of learning four things and you try and teach six, not only will they they'll learn those first four, then they won't be able to learn the next two and attempt to teach those next two will cause them to forget some of the ones they just learned. So you may have taught six, they'll actually only retain two. So if we see kids really struggling to learn in the first place, we try and teach less, but with more sessions. We also make the stimuli more errorless and salient. So in the math world, errorless and salient usually means we're teaching the wrong type of information. This is where we really try to differentiate conceptual from procedural. I know lots of teachers who are child struggling to learn a math concept or learn math, they get the manip manipulatives out and reteach it. My contention is oftentimes that's a waste of time. 
because really the kid understands it conceptually. They just need to figure out the procedure and teach them that. But some kids do need to understand the concept much better. So our task is to try and differentiate between those two. And we do so by looking at the instructional hierarchy of both conceptual and procedural knowledge, both follow the same pattern. So as children are learning conceptual understanding, it follows the same four phases. And it was the first learning it, they need explicit instruction, the basic principles with modeling with manipulatives, then practice the manipulatives, instructional games, and word solving, problem solving with, with manipulatives and concepts. They also will learn the, through uh, the learning hierarchy, the procedures as well, same kind of thing. They start off with explicit instruction, the steps, modeling with written problems, then lots of practice with those written problems, generalization, applying number operations to applied problems and using numbers to solve problems in the classroom. Our task is to think where these two go together. We, we've suggested and found that kids have to learn the math concept when they're proficient in it and they're, then they can generalize it, that's when they're ready to be taught the procedure. So our task is to figure out where in this particular sequence the kid is functioning. And we do so through a conceptual assessment. Now, for times you can't really get into conceptual assessment, but here's, here's an example of one where we give this out to a group of kids, and there's a visual stimulus to match two um, problems. And the kids simply circle which number problem matches the, the uh, which number sentence matches the visual stimulus. And we also have one where we ask the kid to write, give the kid a problem, ask the kid to draw a picture, that goes with the problem and use the picture to solve the problem. So for example, this little girl wrote two times four, she wrote two times four circles equals eight, three times five, three smiley faces times three circles equals 15. We then ask a series of questions. We asked, how'd you figure this problem out? She said, I counted threes and the fives. And then we asked some follow-up questions, which I'll kind of skip over for time's sake right now. How'd you add them up? How'd you find them? I'm sorry, how'd you find the answer? Add them up. Then really the whole thing could come down to this one question. We point to the circle and the, the smiley faces, whatever figure they drew, and said, what does this mean? How do they help you solve the problems? And they say that it's pictures. They're a smiley face. They're happy like me. Um, and then we say, tell me what this means, what you're thinking in your head. When you're doing this multiplication, how does this show the problem? Because it's the exact same numbers and stuff. How do you check your answers to see if it's correct? Go back and do it again. Then we score these responses. To, uh, using a four-point rubric of one being unsatisfactory little accomplishment up to four being really understands it and we use that four-point rubric, rubric to address these four these six items counsel their understanding gave it a four she put a two if it said two she put you know five circles etc understands the number sign she those next two understands the number sign understands the facts of adding subtraction etc kind of go together like they, they she put them together she made them bigger gave both of those twos it can be talked into a one probably, but probably not a three. Uses the visual model with the correct relationship. Now we give that a two because there should have been for three times five, three sets of five circles, for example. Uses the identifiable strategy. No, we give that a one. We could see no strategy at all. Basically, she just memorized it. But what's cool about this is this one. Answers the problem correctly. Yes, she answered the problem correctly. So if we don't dive in more deeply, we don't really understand what's going on. So this little girl got six, eight, ten, got 14 correct, I'm sorry, 15 correct, which out of, out of a possibility of 24. So we've said 18 or less suggests that the child doesn't understand it conceptually. This little girl is struggling to understand basic multiplication conceptually. So if that's the case, again, for time's sake, you can't really tell you about interventions, a whole bunch of them. Here's two, a couple good resources. Van de Waal was a mathematician who does really great work in um, conceptual understanding. So he's got some uh, pretty much every grade level, he's got this curriculum that he designed for student-centered mathematics. I wouldn't use it as a curriculum, but boy, it's full of really good interventions for conceptual understanding. So just to cut to the chase here, here's a little kid that in neither, we did the wrong intervention first. Okay, so this kid understood it conceptually, and we implemented the conceptual intervention, it didn't help. But once we started the procedure, which is what the kid actually needed, they took off. Different kids, same setup, but reversed. This kid 
understood it, did not understand it conceptually. There seems to be a, a typo there a little bit. So baseline didn't help. Having practice math facts didn't help, but once we taught him the concept, then he did well. So it's important to match the concept, the, the, the intervention to if they understand it conceptually or not. So if the child's struggling to learn it in the first place, we're going to assess the conceptual understanding to see if we need to address that. Then we might teach more sessions with fewer, uh, fewer items taught in each one. How often are struggling to remember what they've learned? The second phase. Well, then I'm going to refer you to an intervention called incremental rehearsal developed by Jim Tucker. Uh, it's a folding in flashcard technique, one new item at a time with uh, instructional level and high repetition. Here's a website um, on my YouTube channel. I've got a couple different videos of IR incremental rehearsal on my, on my YouTube channel. But if you go to YouTube and si simply Google, Google incremental rehearsal within YouTube, you'll find it. Lots of videos, again, for times I can't really show you what that is here. But well, we've used it to teach kids who are math, their math facts. It's a group of kids who are you know, severely LD in math, taught them their math facts, no problem with IR. And again, lots of studies showing its effectiveness. Here's some samples, including the one I just showed you. And then the cotting study here was a replication of it, also saw good effects. I think remember rehearsal is a really great intervention for kids who struggle to remember their math facts. They learn it in the first place or struggle to learn anything. Learn it in the first place, but don't recall it. IR is a really great approach for them. It's an intensive intervention, it's one-on-one. -on -one. So I would try other things first, but if they're struggling to learn it and remember it, this is a great approach to use. And then lastly, generalization. Again, a quick comment on that. Here's the say, ask, check approach by Montague in 1992. Most of you are probably using R cubed or some other strategy approach like that. This is a more in-depth, involved, intensive intervention than that. So this is not what you're teaching in general ed. This is a more intensive, generalizing strategy for kids who struggle to generalize it. They learn it in the first place, they remember it, they just can't apply it. What I, what I do is I, I explicitly teach them how to do this, print it up on a little card, have them carry that little card around with them as a reminder, and we practice it so they can learn how to use this. So that completes the webinar on Math RTI, uh, MTSS. We talked about using a using the right data to answer the right question, using general outcome measures and subscale mastery measures, then looking at tier one, classified interventions, tier two, category of the problem, and then tier three, using, identifying the causal variable through struggling to learn it in the first place, struggling to retain it, or struggling to generalize it. Thank you.